some major injury updates from camp on Friday. We are also going to look at some mailbag questions from you all, including talks about the Big Ten taking the lunch money from the ACC and some under the radar players that you want to know about that could play a role on today's uh, game. All of this and more on today's Locked On Boston College. You are Locked On Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Boston College, I am your host, AJ Black here, and I hope you are all having a great end of your week. It's getting closer and closer to game time. We are almost two weeks away from the start of the Boston College football season, and I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty pumped about it. Now, on Thursday, Jeff Halfley met with the media to talk about a few things, and one of the big updates that he gave was injuries. Now, you know, obviously the big injury going into the season was uh, right guard Christian Mahogany, who was out for the year with a leg injury that or a knee injury that he sustained outside of football. So the big names that came up over the last two weeks of guys that have been out have been center Drew Kendall, who you see in your picture up there on the screen, and wide receiver Jalen Gill. Now, Drew Kendall was the big one because... Uh, as we said, I mean, I've said it till my face turns blue. This offensive line is patchwork right now, or it's a bunch of names that we're not sure of. And Kendall seems to be one of the ones that I think a lot of folks are really excited about. Obviously, he comes from a great lineage. You know, his dad, Pete Kendall, was a BC legend. Uh, he was a four-star recruit, you know, with a, a very uh, g- great story about how he committed to BC over Michigan. So you're waiting for this kid to get here. And then all of a sudden, he's out, out of practice. Well, on Thursday, Jeff Halfley confirmed that Kendall has been back at practices in a limited capacity. He's not at full go yet, but he's he is working with the team. Uh, he's working and doing things out there. What that means, it's hard to say because, again, practice is not open to the media for most of the parts. He could be just working out. He could be doing stretching. He could be doing things like that. He said as well that he does not expect Kendall to be out very long. He does not expect this to be a long-term thing. Uh, and he has positive hopes about this this injury being kind of brief. So there is your first positive piece of news here on Locked on BC. Remember, if you want to get your news here, we're your, your first listen every day. And we are your Boston College experts here at Locked on BC. Now, the second player that has been out is Jalen Gill, a wide receiver. Now, Gill missed three games last year with an injury. Uh, his uh, injury has been, uh, uh, both of these guys have injuries that are undisclosed. BC, if you've been following Boston College under Jeff Halfley, you know how guarded he is with these injury reports. He doesn't tell you anything. And so they're both going to, we're going to call them undisclosed injuries, right? Gill has been out and he also has returned to practice again in a limited capacity. And he falls under that same umbrella of what Steven, uh, sorry, what um, Drew Kendall has, you know, basically he's out there doing some stuff. We don't know exactly what that means, but again, Halfley says he doesn't expect both of these guys to be out that long. Now, as I was mentioning Halfley and his injury reports, they're hard to gauge sometimes, right? We've seen reports where it, it, you're worried about it. And then all of a sudden he's out there and then there's other ones that sound like it's minor and he's out for the year. So it's hard to gauge where this actually means, what this actually means. I I get the sense listening to Halfley that he is being truthful and that most, I, I, the hope sounds like that both of these guys will be ready for, for the Rutgers game. But I understand the hesitation from some folks when you read into his, his, his words um, that maybe they're, they may miss some time, but cross your fingers. Now, if either of these guys were to miss time, you know, Jackson Ness, a defensive lineman that has converted to center most likely would be the center starting on game one. Uh, obviously, you know, it's a guy that is just converted to a position that has a lot of expectations. It's a little worrisome there, even though coach Googs, their offensive line coach and Halfley have both been positive about him saying, you know, this is a kid with a great work ethic. You still, you know, the natural instinct is to worry about that, right? You're worrying that he could be a guy that, um, you know, may not be up to the level of what you would get for Kendall. And that's natural to think that, right? And at least as I, as we said with Mitch Wolf, if you haven't listened to it on Monday, if, if Jalen Gill is down, BC has a plethora 
of potential other wide receivers that could step in, whether it's Joseph Griffin or Lewis Bond or Dante Reynolds, depending on the need. They have plenty of guys that could step in and fill that role. And I think that's super important because, you know, you're looking at a, a team this year that even the coaching staff has said, you know, there is a, um, a depth. Finally, they have depth at some positions. They didn't, they specifically mentioned the, the defensive line, but wide receiver is absolutely one that they have too. like, they've got some guys out there that I'm just excited to see play. Like, I want to see what Lewis Bond can do. I want to see what Dante Reynolds can do because I've heard so much about them from the coaching staff, but it doesn't sound like those are too, too bad. And there hasn't been any other injuries to report. Now, again, let me kind of frame this for you. BC had a scrimmage on Monday. It was completely close to the media scrimmages. They're playing at full strength. I mean, at full go with pads and everything injuries happen, but because it's behind closed doors right now, the media isn't allowed to know about it unless we watch you know, something in the first half hour that set like we caught with Kendall and Gill. So it's hard to gauge what is actually happening. And, and I think that's by design. I don't think it's the staff being, being sneaky per se, but they're trying to pr- mitigate potential advantages in terms of how other teams can game plan if they know a p- player is out. But it sounds like that. I mean, it was a c- pretty uh, nondescript press conference. Halfley talked a lot about um, that the defense feels like they're ahead of schedule. He says in years past, they haven't, but because now they're ahead of schedule, they can do some new things. They're playing fast. They're playing fierce. That's good. That was something else that he brought up. That was really good. Uh, there were some other questions in there that I didn't feel worth it. We got a chance to talk to Chris Banks and um, Ozzy Trapillo. And, you know, it was good to talk to both of those guys. Ozzy Trapillo is one of the tallest guys I've ever seen on a football in football pads. He's six, eight, six, nine. He's absolutely enormous. Uh, he was talking about being an offensive lineman, about Coach Googs, about Drew Kendall. Uh, he has a pretty good relationship with Drew Kendall because they played together in high school and 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 before that. But I, I thought, the, you know, there was nothing really else to bring up from that press conference. It was quiet. Now, uh, this week, they're going to have their second um, – they're going to have their second scrimmage on Sunday and then media day is on Monday. So on Monday, you're going to get more um, press conferences and interviews. Hope if I can get any specifically for the podcast, believe me, I'm going to try. Uh, so stay tuned. I'm going to see what I can do to, to bring some fun stuff onto the podcast. Now in a moment, I'm going to get into a specific mailbag question that came in on the internet. Uh, on Twitter, it's internet. I sound like my dad uh, about the ACC and Big Ten, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Now, Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your sports betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find re- reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball. NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the on top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting scores and podcasts. They have you covered. I love using it for baseball, but man, I am so pumped for football. You know, they're going to have all those player props on there. I'm sure I can't wait to see what the BC player props are on Bet Online. I'm sure they're going to have some for Phil Jakovic and Zay Flowers. Be interesting to talk about that on this podcast, but we'll get into that. And you got to go over to check out Bet Online and see what other props they have up there because there's some good ones. So head on over to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action and happening. Bet Online, where the game starts. This is Locked On Boston College, AJ Black here. And now we're going to hit up the mailbag. And I want to thank all of you who hit up the mailbag this week. There were some great questions, and I have a couple answers to some things that are going on uh, that I think were really good questions. And the first one has to do with the Big Ten. And it was on Twitter, and it was at Locked On BC. Thank you to um, one of our question makers, uh, and I totally lost his name here, but he asked about the ACC. How bad of a shape are they in now that the um, Big Ten has their $7 billion media deal? Now, if you missed the deal on Thursday, this is this is a game changer in terms of the college sports landscape. And this isn't a big surprise. This is the exact same type of deal that we had expected the Big Ten to get. But they got seven between seven and eight billion dollars for a seven year deal that goes across Fox, FS1, CBS, and I believe NBC. 
and they're all going to rotate different games. There's going to be a whole system where they're going to have all their games spread out over those three networks. This is big. And the money in this is huge. And the takeaway from this is obviously the money, which makes the Big Ten, you know, miles ahead of the ACC in terms of the money per year each member school is going to get. It's going to be two times what the ACC is getting. Think about that. Rutgers is going to make two times as much as Clemson. How do you think Clemson's feeling right now, right? You're getting that. But on top of all of this was Kevin Warren, the Big Ten commissioner's comment that it makes it sound like their expansion is not done. Now, I think when you're when they're saying that, I have I I have I have landed on where I think the ACC is right now. I don't think Clemson, Miami, Florida State, any of those schools are going anywhere given the the state of their grant of rights. It's just way too expensive. The ACC would own them if they played another conference, they'd make no money. So it makes no sense for them to do that. But there is a conference that is right now about to start their own media deal. And they are in a much worse position than the big 10. And that's the PAC 12. So to me, Kevin Warren's position says to me that, Hey, they might be going after Oregon, Washington. They're going to get their, their coach to coast conference that they're looking for up North. And if they get Oregon and Washington, that really does solidify that the Big Ten and SEC are miles ahead of the ACC at this point. It is bad news, and and Jim Phillips can do his you know innovation and revenue checking program that he has, but unless they can figure out something, something that can actually get the money up to where they're at, it's worrisome for the future of this program and the future of this conference too, because it just seems like the ACC is, is they, there's nothing they can do. Like it, it almost feels hopeless for the conference, right? Like if they are only, and I hope Jim Phillips is not doing this. If they are, if they are, you know, putting all their eggs in one basket and that basket is Notre Dame, then yeah, that would be great. But I hope that they have plan B, plan C, plan D that can mitigate if they lose out on Notre Dame. Cause to me right now, you know, Notre Dame's, uh, their, their media deal ends, I think, in another year. And if they end in a year, if you were Notre Dame and you were an irrational, sane person, would you go to the Big Ten, stay independent, or go to the ACC? I would go with option A or B nine, 99 times out of 100, and the, and the other one maybe because I fell asleep and, and raised my hand at the wrong time. I think the ACC needs to think of something and I don't know what that is. I am. I, I have sat here and thought and thought and thought of different ways for this conference to keep themselves afloat and to keep themselves going at the same level. And I, can, I honestly, I'm stuck. I'm stuck with what they can do now. They can make some other moves. They can try to poach the big 12. I mean, right now the ESPN grant of rights deal is such a red, it's such a albatross on their neck that there really isn't much this conference can do like that. It, you know, I'm hoping, and I've said this on this podcast before that ESPN is considering that, you know, it's one thing to make a lot of money and to have an advantageous deal on, on, on your books, but there's also having the right product out there. Now, if your product stinks because you can't keep it up to date versus the other competitors, then you know, your short-term game, your short-term outlooks are not going to match what's actually going to happen. Because if the ACC stinks and ESPN owns all the rights to them, but no one's watching it because there's that shiny new product on e on uh, on Fox and on you know their other station with e SEC, they're not going to do anything with them, and they're not going to make them money. People are going to tune out of the ACC other than maybe a few like Clemson, Florida state games or whatnot. So as I've said, there needs to be some foresight by ESPN to figure out some ways with the conference and work together. Hopefully this new program that they have will figure some pieces out, but man, they got to figure something out quickly because the big 10 just took a huge uppercut and directly planted it in the side of the ACC. They are not in good shape right now. The big 10, you know, I don't know how they're going to get out of this. I don't know how the ACC is going to figure this out. I still, I know folks have been in the comment section saying, oh, you know, they're going to go to court and FSU and Miami and Clemson, they're gone. I have heard nothing. If that was the case, 
if any lawyer saw the potential to get them out of this grant of rights deal, you would have heard of it by now because those schools would have ran as fast as they could, but they can't. I'm sure the lawyers have looked over with a fine tooth comb to figure out what ways they can get them out of this, but they can't, they're stuck. So as much as, you know, those fans are can say whatever they want. I don't see the ACC dissolving, but I see the ACC limping and I see the ACC falling drastically behind the other two power conferences here. And they need to figure something out quick because if the big 10 swallows up more of the pac 12, there's going to be less options for them out there. What do you do? Merge with the big 12. I mean, you could have Cincinnati and West Virginia again. That'd be kind of cool, but is that enough? I mean, there's gotta be something here and I don't, I don't see an answer yet. And it's going to take some time and take some time for them to figure this out. Now in our final segment, I'm going to go rapid fire through some of your questions because you all had some great uh, questions. Some of them fun, some of them serious, and I'm going to get into them all. Now, if you like this podcast, Locked On does a great job being uh, your team every day. We are your Boston College team every day. And you can find all sorts of other podcasts, either you like pro sports or league sports, whatever you want. ACC, we have an ACC podcast. But I want to tell you about the Ultimate College Football Preview. And the Ultimate College Football Preview is here. It's a seven-episode preview with local college experts, local team experts, and Odyssey College Football Insiders. It's everything you need to be ready for the college football season in one spot. So search for the Ultimate College Football Preview on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, Locked On Boston College here. This is AJ Black. I am also the publisher of Eagle Insider. I give you all the great Boston College news and insight from someone who's on the on the scene, at practices, at press conferences. You're going to only get it here. And we're the only, the only Boston College podcast that does this five days a week. And I thank you for all of you who have made this your first listen every morning. All right, so we're going to go jump into the mailbag here. And I I did a poor job of writing down a name here, so I don't have it. But someone wanted to know who are t- some names of players that could jump up on the two deep or we could hear more about the season that haven't hasn't been brought up in uh, press practice reports or via some of the press conferences that we've talked about. One name that I have not heard anything about prior to this year, he's a redshirt freshman, I believe, is Nick Thomas. He is an offensive lineman for the Eagles. He was a freshman last year, number 61 from East Orange, Immaculate Conception. Um, I have heard he's now 6'4", 301. He's going to be a guard. With BC's lack of depth, this could be a guy to watch for. He could be a guy that maybe sneaks into the 2D, maybe gets some playing time if there's someone banged up. I don't know much about him, honestly, other than he came, he came here uh, last year. You know, uh, he is a new name. He'll be someone worth watching for on the defensive side of the ball. I keep going back to Quan Williams uh, at the defensive line position, and he's popped up a few times during pra- uh, practice reports. But in terms of game changing defensive linemen that are ready to go right now, he is on that list. Now, I know BC has some good depth at defensive tackle that, you know, Boozy and Wuka, they have Cam Horsley, both are veterans at this point. Chris Banks is a veteran and uh, Isaiah Henderson. I mean, they're all vets at this point. They've all had multiple years of experience, but Quan Williams strikes me as the next like game changing defensive tackle, like a guy that could go out there and make a big play, make, you know, really d- dominate on that line. He was a, he was a borderline four-star recruit last year. So I, I think he could be someone that really, steps up this year. He's a name I really like. Um, Another name that I would watch for, and I brought him up a few times, but I'm going to take credit when credit's due, is Amari Jackson, defensive back. I I, I have noticed, and I think many of you noticed too, you know, when, when BC is going nickel, they go nickel a lot. And that's a good thing. You know, if you're trying to match your, your strength up against their offenses, you get more defensive backs out there. You get more of your talented players out there. That being said, you need a lot of defensive backs to play in the nickel because some kind of times you need to get guys out for rest. You need to put in new guys. Some guys get dinged up. One name that has not popped up is Amari Jackson. He is a true freshman from Georgia. He is highly recruited. He was only a three-star, but believe me, he had a lot of SEC interest. Tennessee really pushed for him at the end, but he stayed with the Eagles. 
I like this kid. I think he's going to be the next CJ Burton style, you know, starter. Like when Josh DeBerry goes next year, don't be surprised if Amari Jackson's out there with Burton as one of the starting cornerbacks. So he is another name I think that's really important. And I don't know if this is a cop out because I mentioned them all the time, but Hey, I'm a podcast that talks about BC sports five days a week. I talk about everybody. So there, there may be guys that you just don't know. And those names, I'm going to go down with Donovan Azaraku, Ty Clemens, and Nito Akpala. I have said, I said it earlier this week. Those are three names that I just expect something out of one of them this year. And then they need a spark on that defensive line. They need a spark at defensive end. And I, I, I expect those to be those names. So hopefully that answers your question of some guys that are not on the depth chart yet that we are still thinking about. And then finally, one other question that came up comes from Martin uh, Martin Artes Jones, who is a fan of the podcast, a great uh, commenter and one of the leaders of the sickos. And I love this question because I always like to end it with something fun. If you had to pick five current BC athletes to be on your team in a Royal Rumble cage match, who are your five? He says, I'm going with Trapillo Big Glock, which is uh, Devin McLaughlin, Quentin Post, the entire sailing team, and Boozy. Okay, so it, just watching the guys that I've seen, um, Ozzy Trapillo is a great one. I was just going to say, I just said in the first segment, he's the tallest guy I've ever seen. <laughs> like, he is absolutely enormous, like Undertaker Kane size, especially when you put cleats on. He's 6'8 without cleats on. He must be 6'10, 6'11 with cleats on. He's just huge. Um, he's a good pick, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go with some maulers here and guys that I think are just vicious. So on the defensive line, I'm going to go with Marcus Valdez. I, you know, he's not the biggest guy. He was 5'10, but he's scrappy. And what is, there's something about undersized guys that have a little chip on their shoulder because they don't have the physical size of like a guy like Ozzy Trapillo or even on the defensive line, a guy like Harold Landry once had. So I, I get the sneaky suspicion that Valdez, if you put him in a cage, would be would be a, a, an animal out there. I think he would be crazy. So he's one of my picks. Um, on the on the offensive side of the ball, I also would like to go. Um, I'd also I, I'm going to stick with your Quentin Post pick because I saw your first half of your answer, and my first thought was Quentin Post. Quentin Post looks like a wrestling heel to me. If you don't know what heels mean, it's like the good guy versus the bad guy. The heels, the bad guy, and they always do like dirty stuff. Something about post strikes me as if he was in a wrestling match, he'd be the guy that would throw an elbow when the ref wasn't looking and hit the guy in the back of the head, that kind of stuff. So Quentin Post is a good one for me too. Next, um, I would pick I would pick Phil Matus, the off the strength and conditioning coach. Okay. There's there, there, you know, he is a guy. If you've ever seen him, he's huge. He's a he's a biker. He has like, you know, all his guys are biker friends. And um, he's a little bit older, but not too much. Like he's in his thirties. So he's, he's still in good shape. Um, he just strikes me as like a Steiner brothers. If again, I'm using wrestling terms. I apologize if you guys don't like wrestling, but old school, like Steiner brothers type of guys that are like, you know, really like built and, and can do some things. So he's another one I would pick on the offensive line side of it. Um, I don't know if I, Terpillo seems too nice to me, even though he's really tall, he seems too nice. Um, if he was healthy, I would go with Christian Mahogany because Christian Mahogany to me also has that like mentality of like, don't mess with me. And he, he has an underdog mentality, but he's also big. He's fast. No one knows who he is. He's going to bang out there and make some big plays. So he is one. And then finally, my final pick, I think this is my fifth one here. My final pick would be um, Charlotte North. And I know she's not on the team right now, but get me in, get, get a woman in there too. Uh, she could take out any other woman out, out there. So if you're fight, fighting a mixed tag match and she's out there, give me Charlotte North. Cause I think she would, she's out of this world in terms of her physicality and what she can do. So that's my pick. And then my manager would be Googs put Googs out there with them. Um, I think Googs is the perfect wrestling manager and would do some really nasty things up there too, to protect his team. So that's my, my, my answer to, to Martin. Thank you for that question. I love, I, you guys know, if you've listened, I, I do like wrestling and um, just sometimes it's a little fun to have this. Now on Monday's episode, we are going to be return uh, back with Mitch Wolf. Mitch has a question about which three guys or what he might actually have more than that. What guys on the roster 
if they play at an excellent level, would be game changers for the Eagles this season. We'll get into his discussions about that. Now, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please hit that like button below and hit subscribe, and it would help our podcast out tremendously if you share this with your friends. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.